Welcome to the Orthopedic Match During the Pandemic, a program director's perspective, a webinar for women and minority medical students that is held as a collaboration between the American Association of Latino Orthopedic Surgeons, J. Robert Gladden Orthopedic Society, and to mention, and the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society. We would like to extend a special thank you to AOFAS for allowing us to utilize their webinar platform to produce this series. I'd like to run through a few housekeeping items before we kick off tonight's webinar. Please make sure your speakers are turned on and that the volume is turned up. For technical assistance, you can reference the help tab at any time. If you have any technical difficulties, your best bet is to close all your browsers and log back in the same way you did the first time. If you are experiencing buffering issues, please refresh your browser. We are recording this webinar and will provide the recording online within one week. You are encouraged to ask questions. We will have 20 minutes at the end for questions. To send your questions to our panelists, please click on the question mark icon on the bottom right of your navigation column. I would now like to turn the program over to the president of RJOS, Dr. Don Laporte. Dr. Laporte. Thank you, Deborah. Um, good evening. I'm honored and excited to welcome all of you to the webinar this evening. Um, my name is Dawn Lahore, and I'm the president of the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society and also a proud member of the Gladden Society and an Empty Mansion mentor. In the past five months, COVID-19 has swept the world as a global pandemic, impacting millions of people. In the best of circumstances, in an ideal application cycle, Orthopedic residencies struggle to attract and match women and minority applicants. This is evidenced by the fact that orthopedic surgery remains the least diverse surgical specialty based on race and gender. I think we can all agree that this year is not the best of circumstances for any applicant, but even more so for women and minority applicants like you. That's why our groups wanted to work together to put together this program. We'll start with some talks on important topics and then a program director panel to address some of your submitted questions. And then we'll open up to live questions for all of the faculty. I'd like to ask uh, the faculty to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, and then we'll move forward with a talk on mentoring during a pandemic from Dr. Taylor and Dr. Ross. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bone. Good evening, thank you. I'm Dr. Deborah Bone. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at the University of Minnesota. I've done a um, fellowship in hand and upper extremity and I specialize in pediatric and adult upper extremity surgery. And I am the RJOS mentoring chair. Dr. Brooks. Hi, my name is Jason Brooks. Uh, I am a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Um, I did my residency training at Johns Hopkins uh, under Dr. Port. She is my program director um, and taught me everything I know. Uh, and then I went on to do PEDS in San Diego. And I'm currently at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Great, thanks. We're going alphabetically, uh, Dr. Kogan. Oh, Dr. Harrington. <laughs> Oh, hi, my name is Monica Kogan. I am the program director at Rush University Medical Center. I do pediatric orthopedic surgery. I trained at Northwestern, and then went on to my fellowship in Salt Lake City, Utah. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. Hi, I'm Mel Harrington. I'm a program director at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. I'm an adult reconstruction uh, surgeon. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mejia? I'm Alfonso Mejia. I'm the program director at the University of Illinois. I'm a hand surgeon. I did my residency at University of Illinois and I did my hand fellowship at Louisville. Dr. Oni? Hello, my name is Dr. Julius Oni. I'm a joint replacement surgeon from Johns Hopkins, trained at NYU Hospital for Joint Diseases, and uh, subsequently did my fellowship at Rush University Medical Center. I also uh, am the diversity chair of the Orthopedic Surgery Diversity Council. Thank you, Dr. Ross. You are muted. I am muted. <laughs> right. Good evening, this is Dr. Ross. Um, HBCU trained and transformed, went to Morehouse College undergrad, Meharry Medical College for 
of med school. I did a fellowship in foot and ankle reconstruction at Emory, but um, I was trial by fire at Martin Luther King Hospital for my orthopedic residency. Uh, currently, I'm a private practice orthopedic yeah. surgeon in Kentucky. Also, I'm the senior director of clinical programs for Nth Dimensions. Fantastic. Dr. Taylor? Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Erica Taylor, orthopedic hand surgeon at Duke University. I'm also the mentoring chair of the J. Robert Gladden Orthopedic Society. I did my residency, uh, including a research year at the University of Virginia, followed by my fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic for hand and upper extremity surgery. And then I am in practice now at Duke University. I've been on faculty going on the start of my eighth year. I'm very, very happy to, to be with you all tonight. Fantastic. And Dr. Van Heest. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Van Heest, and I'm a hand surgeon at the University of Minnesota. I'm also the program director at University of Minnesota, where I have been. This is my 16th year. Um, I am a hand surgeon as well. I trained at the University of Minnesota and did my hand fellowship out through the Harvard system uh, and then returned to uh, have my uh, career primarily at University of Minnesota. I look forward to hearing the talks tonight and uh, generating some great ideas. Thank you all. All right, let's move forward with Dr. Taylor and Dr. Ross. Right now we're getting our slides loaded up. I just wanted to make sure we, we understood what your opportunity is here for this evening. And we're going to talk about mentoring, we're going to talk about networking, we're going to talk about how you can manipulate, maneuver, and navigate to make certain you take advantage of whatever opportunities there are for you to get into orthopedic programs. But I want you to make certain that you understand the people on this call, on this evening, are folks who are clearly committed and dedicated to making this happen for you. Please don't miss this opportunity to reach out to us. Okay, mentorship during COVID-19. Okay, I am Dr. Ross, Dr. Taylor. We'll, we'll talk with you later. I already mentioned that I'm HBCU educated and transformed uh, for me. I, I am a, proudly the Senior Director of Clinical Programs for Nth, Nth Dimensions. Um, this is a program that is dedicated to transforming the healthcare landscape by eliminating healthcare disparities and diversifying the physician workforce. We can talk more about that um, later. I, I may, wanted to make sure I emphasize committed and passionate mentor, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how important that is. And also, health equity warrior. You are on a you are on a call with a ton of folks who have been fighting for health equity, and I have fought with several of these individuals um, in a variety of different ways. Um, that's important in the fact that health equity is still not yet achieved, and we need to continue to fight for that. Okay. And then I'll just, before Dr. Ross goes on, again, I'm Dr. Taylor. I listed much of what I've said already here. But again, just to echo Dr. Ross, it's important to take note of who is devoting their evening to speaking to you all. We all are on a mission to make sure this process is as equitable as possible. We have a long way to go in orthopedic surgery. Every touch point counts. So please take note of commonalities outside of demographics that you find with the people speaking with you tonight. I listed some of the things that I do here for my department. I'm the vice chair of diversity and inclusion. I'm also an MBA student using a lot of strategy implementation skills to do this work well. So please stay in touch with us. Ask us anything you need. Um, we're here for you tonight. Okay, so, so for me, I wanted to start with the idea of mentorship. Mentorship is hardwired for each and every one of us. From when time we're born, we are dedicated to having guidance. We some call it parenting. At some levels, it's teaching. At some levels, it's counseling. But we are designed to be guided until we can guide ourselves and then guide others. And so I want you to make sure that you, you recognize that this is something that we are designed to participate in. Not one person on this call or not one person who's made a successful entry into any profession has done it absolutely by themselves. At some point, someone has had to either recognize their talent, someone's had to invite them in or expose them to a network that's helped them. This is your opportunity for that. Okay, next up. Okay, so I, I wanna just start off with this. Okay, this is not to just toot my own horn. Uh-oh, we gotta go back though. Are we, okay, so 
the bottom line is I, when I got to, I want to tell a story a little bit about how critically important mentorship is. And one of the first things is for you as a mentee, you got to show something. You got to show some degree of excellence, drive, et cetera. This is my first report card at Morehouse College. I went to Morehouse. I was really excited. I went to class. I was, I, I engaged with teachers. These are things that I had never done before. As a high school student, I, I was totally unrecognizable as a first year um, freshman at Morehouse. And so in, in the quest for excellence, I encountered people. One of them was J.K. Haynes, who actually challenged me to try and get an A in his class, which I eventually did. And in our interaction, um, I didn't realize who he was at the time and what his commitment was to, to leadership and his commitment to mentorship, but we began to interact and we began, I began to share with him what my goals and desires were. And so I started off really well and then, then something happened. Okay, this is the next, next slide. This guy down at the bottom of this slide, um, he's, a, he's an alumnus of Morehouse College. He came to film a movie on campus. And so um, in the midst of my academic rise, I got sucked into the, the movie making of Spike Lee on school days. Next slide. Okay, now if, if we can play this just, just for a hot second, okay, I just want to let people, let people recognize that I actually had hair at one time. Okay, you may not be able to hear it, but this is what I did instead of going to semester, going to school for a whole semester. That's me on the right hand side. You can stop right there. We don't need to see any more of this. Okay, but the bottom line was instead of doing what I had set out to do initially, I did this instead. Next slide. And this was the result immediately following that semester. You don't have to try and figure it out. You know there aren't any A's on there. There actually aren't any any decent grades on there. This is a zero. 0.0 GPA for a semester, okay? And at this particular point, I recognized that I was never, ever going to be an orthopedic surgeon. It was over for me, all right? But I had, um, I had an advocate in my corner. You can next slide for me. This is J.K. Haynes. This is the, the gentleman I talked to you about. He, is, he was committed at Morehouse, and he's still there. I took my son to meet him to be mentored. He is committed to training physician scientists. He's been doing it for multiple decades. He has a track record that's unbelievable, and he is very, very interested in those who show promise. And so J.K. Haynes, based on the promise that I'd shown earlier, took it upon himself to contact Meharry Medical College and get me in. I did not apply. He asked Dr. James Story to let me be part of the freshman class, the first year class. They said yes. That's how I became a physician. That's how I became an orthopedic surgeon. He was not only a mentor, but he became an advocate. And this is an incredible, this is an important concept. You don't want someone just to sign your letter. You don't want someone just to tell you what they did. You want somebody who's going to listen to what your goals, aspirations are to, to process those and then find the opportunities that best fit you. And that process, how you do that, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Next slide. Okay, so now, how do you choose, okay? We can go to the next slide. How do you choose to have the best mentor? And it really is based on the things that we just talked about. You can go to the next slide. Um, one, you gotta, you gotta first go to where the mentors are, okay? Say, for example, you're on a Zoom call with a dozen folks who have taken time during their Tuesday evening, okay, to sit with you and answer questions. That might be a place where mentors are. Say, for example, you're on this same Zoom call, people let you ask questions about anything. That might be a time to, to develop a mentor. Look at the names of the people here. Look, these, look mm -hmm. us and other folks up. And if we can't find, if we can't connect with you directly, we can find someone who can connect with you. This picture below is, is a whole bunch of, of African-American female orthopedic surgeons. When I took this picture, I realized I had never, ever seen that many together. And I've been around for a little bit, okay? Uh, um, Dr. Taylor is in that picture. She um, she was in the process of doing something very, very important during that time. All right, but but the goal here is to recognize that going to the, where the mentors are is an, an important part of getting getting the the guidance, the the connection that you're going to need in order to be mentored appropriately. Okay, next slide for me. So so as we go forward, we're going to talk a little bit more important. I'm trying to go fast because there's a there's a time limit clearly, and I may or may not be making it, okay? So the, the bottom line for us right now is 
you need to find mentors who are committed. That means that they are committed to mentorship, period. Okay, that they've been doing it for a period of time, that they're experienced at it, that they have a true and dedicated interest to in making it happen. The second is they have to be interested in you and your effort. They can't just be, oh, they can't just be somebody who has mentored previously, but they've got to be interested in mentoring you. If they're not interested in mentoring you, then it's very, very difficult for you to establish the relationship that's necessary for you to truly benefit from that relationship. And they have to be good at it. They need to have be at least experienced, but certainly successful. You, you look, um, say, for example, in college coaching, there are coaches who have trained other coaches who have gone on to be successful. You want to find mentors who have trained other mentors who have gone on to be successful. And you can find that by, say, for example, you're on a Zoom call and there are mentors. Oh, OK, we've talked about that already. OK, but the bottom line is that if there is if there is a way for if there is a way for you to connect, if there's someone that you need to be, gain access to, then the people who are already committed to making that happen are the people that you ask. And the ask is important. And, and Dr. Taylor is going to talk about some of the approaches and, uh, and others as well about how you approach a mentor. But Look for somebody who's committed. Look for somebody who's interested in you, not just to, to make you work during in their research lab, not just to be able to, to get you to make their papers look good. You need somebody who's interested truly in you. That means they're gonna ask questions, they're gonna inquire about your life and your livelihood and your likes and dislikes. And they need to be good at it, or at least to be experienced at it. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to do it for decades and decades. There are gonna be near peer mentors who are gonna be important to you, people who have just gotten into practice, but they, they still need to be committed, interested in you, and able to give you the time, effort, and energy that's necessary for you to be successful, okay? Recognize that there are a ton of folk out there who are ready, willing, and able to make your journey at least less onerous than ours, but you're going to have to make the approach. You're going to have to recognize that these particular distilled, um, characteristics of mentors are important, and then you're going to have to be able to develop these relationships. And I'm gonna hand that off to, to Dr. Taylor so she can tell you how to do that. All right, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Ross. So we'll, that was excellent. I hope you all are taking notes. Um, just to wrap up this part of the talk tonight, I just have two quick slides with some bullet points to touch on where we are in a pandemic and you all still needing mentors. Uh, and also needing to be mentee. So I'm gonna come to you from the vantage point or the perspective of the mentee. So there's a little bit that changed, um, primarily in this time, how we form bonds with strangers has changed. Some of the people who are participating in the call tonight, I've had to form bonds with and I've never been in the same room with them ever. And I don't know when that will happen. Um, so we change how we interact. We change how many people, right? We can interact with, there's now, limits, there's laws about that. The places we are when we interact is different and also the opportunities we have to showcase our talents. So give you a little example, this is me when I was a sub I back in, it doesn't matter when, but it was not last year. And this is one of my first mentors, Dr. Bobby Chabra, who is the chair of orthopedics at the University of Virginia. So this is what I could do. I could take this picture with him. I could stand this close to him. I could learn from him like this. And then, you know, you fast forward a couple years later, to um, here at, at Duke, we had a dinner at my chair's house. Everyone's sitting less than six feet apart. We're, we're having food together, we're eating together. We could do that, we could learn from attendings and division chiefs. Um, we can't do that anymore. We definitely can't do this, right? So this is last year's AOS meeting, Dr. Weber, AOS president standing in the center, Dr. Mason and Dimensions, founder, CEO, Emeritus is standing right there. And that's something we can't do. So we are changing the way we're bonding with each other. We're changing the way we interact. And quite frankly, it looks like this now. And so this is the SNMA uh, virtual conference from this past April. This is my chair in the middle, Dr. Benjamin Allman, one of our residents and myself, um, you know, at home, mentoring students and mentoring several of them the way we would have done if we had been in person. So the expectations of mentorship have to evolve. And you know, just to be honest, there's no right or wrong answer. I couldn't give you a formula for it, but these are some differences to remember. Mentorship, what does that mean right now? How many touch points qualify you as a mentor? If you send an email to me, does that mean I'm your mentor? Because we can't be in the same place? There's a risk of burnout. So I want you as mentees to think about that. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, 0.3% of practicing orthopedic surgeons are black women. 1.9% are African American in general. So there's a small number and we would all love to mentor at the same time, but 
there is this risk of burnout. We are blending work with home. We're having these meetings at home. We're having work meetings at home. There is no more boundary. And that can really cause um, some stress on your desired mentor. And so just a few tips as we, as we transition to the next slide or the next talk, this is the last one we have, um, is really just to reset and redefine your expectation. That's the, the most pointed uh, guidance I can give you. But most important, demonstrate empathy. So a lot of things our institutions have done have been to try to create a sense of normalcy. This is our new normal, new reality. We're restoring platforms. Students are coming back to school. But your mentors are still frontline workers. They're still working in the midst of pandemic. So before you start a message, for example, with what you need, ask them what they need. Ask them how they're doing. We're still working. You're still working. We need to check in with each other. Look and listen for cues. Zoom platforms may not be the best for the mentor. So offer different things and see if that communication style needs to change. Be creative. Be open to group mentoring. That goes back to that 0.3% and the 1.5 to 1.9% I mentioned earlier. Be open to being mentored in a group. That's how you form your teams, your colleagues, your allies. That's how many of us got to be friends for the last decade plus is by being mentored in a group format. And then also one little trick, learn the technology in the virtual platforms. Let me tell you, our residents are killing it. They can do Zoom breakouts, all sorts of stuff. There's video footage they're creating. If you know how to do that, you will set the bar high. And so take the time that you may not be really rotating on the wards as much and learn how to facilitate technology. Your mentors will appreciate that because we all have to do it. And so this is, I hope many of you, I'm looking at the those of you who are on right now, may have been in this session with me last week. This is what 2020 summer mentoring looks like. And these are all students outside of my institution. Um, and this, quite frankly, is what we need to do. We need to do more of it. Um, so hopefully these are catalyst discussion points. Feel free to ask me more uh, later on. Good evening. Do I have control now? I do. OK, great. So um, I've already introduced myself. Um, I'm Deb Bone. I'm a hand surgeon at the University of Minnesota. And I'm going to talk a little bit about networking. Networking is always important when you're trying to get into a competitive field, but right now it's even more important than ever because the opportunities may be fewer. So I'm hopefully going to talk about a few of the nuts and bolts of things that you can do to network. Um, so you are going to have to initiate the conversation. This is difficult. Nobody wants to do this, especially I think people in your generation are unaccustomed to reaching out, speaking um, in ways that are um, considered more um, standard or mainstream and professional um, as people in my generation. This is gonna be up to you. And if you don't do it, then nobody's gonna do it for you. Um, Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing. It's a really tiny little button. There we go. Um, you're going to have to put yourself out there and take a few risks. Um, and this is going to be your responsibility. People will help you, but nobody's going to do this for you. All right. So the first thing is, I would say, network locally. So um, I think getting involved with your home program or your local program is really important. I'm going to say local program as we go along, but but truly, we know that not everybody has a local program. Everybody should have the opportunity to rotate somewhere though. So if you are at a medical school that doesn't have a orthopedic surgery program, you should be allowed to rotate at a program. So then consider that your home or your local program and really work to get involved. Um, there is gonna be a medical student and or a residency program coordinator at each of the um, sites that you rotate at, make sure you get to know them. They will be a great asset for understanding what's available, what's going on. Connect with the residents that you rotate with and the whole program residents. Ask them for opportunities to present, um, be available for the social um, opportunities because those are gonna be um, really great in increasing your social equity by being seen and being known by the residents at your home program or where you rotate. <clears throat> um, Join your orthopedic surgery interest group and see what, what they've got going on. Don't miss that opportunity. 
And then, um, of course, as you know, get involved in research projects. And this time it might be more than one and it might be more than one site. So um, make sure that you're reaching out to people and trying to get connected in that way. Then um, I think for away programs, you definitely want to try to connect with programs virtually. Many programs have, um, have programs in place to um, get students involved. Residency programs think of this as an opportunity to expose you to their program and an opportunity to take a look at you. So there are gonna be things that you can do to find out about programs such as, again, contacting the residency program coordinator or student coordinator, following them on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, most programs or many programs are getting savvy about having pages that you guys can follow and see what's going on. That gives you a good flavor for the program, I think. Um, a lot of programs are hosting special programs, so make sure that you reach out to those programs and take advantage of those as much as you can. <clears throat> um, Things that they're gonna be doing are journal clubs, grand rounds, attending their um, conferences, and hopefully getting you some chances to interact with their residents and faculty. Remember, they wanna they want to talk to you as much as you wanna to talk to them during this time. <clears throat> Next, sorry, I'm having a hard time advancing. There we go. Then there are national programs that you can network with. So, Right in front of you, you've got representatives from all these um, uh, national programs, but there are lots more. If you want to get out your phone, I think on the next slide, I'm going to have a picture of a whole bunch of letters, a lot of alphabet soup on all of the orthopedic programs there are out there or orthopedic organizations there are out there. I hope I'm sure I missed somebody, but hopefully not. Um, but snap a picture of that and you can go and look at some of those they have. Um, ways for students to get involved often or special um, programs that you can um, connect into. The AAOS is doing um, some of this work as are all of the organizations represented here today. Um, all of the organizations that are represented today also have mentor pairings. And so you can go to any of these programs and request a one-to-one -one mentor. One thing I would suggest is that you don't drop the ball and make the mistake of not following through. I'm the mentoring program or the mentoring committee chair at RJOS and I hear from a lot of faculty that they got paired with a mentor and then they really never heard from them. So take advantage of that. Um, <clears throat> sorry to be slow here. The Perry Initiative. Um, so if you haven't heard of the Perry Initiative for Women, um, this is a program that medical students can do to get exposed to orthopedic surgery. Um, a lot of programs are gonna be doing these virtually and there's gonna be a, a, an altered program for that. I did go to the Perry website today and I didn't see any um, programs scheduled, but I know it, in Minnesota, we're gonna host one, I believe in October or November. So those are probably gonna be starting to come online. So that's a good way to meet some of the faculty, or, you know, meet some of the faculty that are involved in those. And then these organizations, um, many times they're looking for medical or residency and medical student um, uh, committee people. And then now it's not cost prohibitive to attend a national meeting. So a lot of these national meetings are going virtual and you can kind of get a sense for, you know, who's there, who's um, interesting it from various programs and there may be some um, meet and greets and social opportunities in there too. Here's that slide I was talking about. So on the right is a picture of the RJOS um, Twitter feed um, highlighting some of the women who won scholarships to the meeting that did not happen. <laughs> um, and then these are a lot of those organizations that, that may have opportunities for you to get involved. Um, finally, I think um, Dr. Taylor already touched on this a bit. You definitely wanna be cognizant of being professional in your interactions with networking um, mentors are, are volunteers, they are eager, but they are volunteers and they're busy. Um, and so make sure that you um, honor and respect that. Um, establish the best medium for communicating. Um, most of us are better at email than Snapchat. So um, plan to establish with people you network with what is the best route of communication and being respectful of um, time constraints, deferential and requests for time. Um, many, many faculty, fair or unfair, are sticklers about grammar, email, punctuation, uh, grammar, grammar, spelling, and punctuation. So make sure that you're very careful about that, even though 
even if you don't care about it, a lot of us do. And so, um, yeah, uh, I don't think I have anything else. Anybody have any, um, actually, never mind. Questions are coming up um, afterward. Here's a, a residency program website that has a click here for virtual lectures and curriculum. All right, so I think we're off to the next speaker. Hello, I'm uh, Alfonso Mejia. Uh, I introduce myself at four as far as where I work. I'm also currently the president of ALICE. Um, Jason and I will be uh, co-hosting this particular lecture. I'm not sure, Jason, do I have drive or do you, I think? I seem to. Okay, so we basically are talking about letters of recommendation and application process, and they're very important right now because Without the ability to do an audition way rotation, this is one of the ways people can get to know you. So I think that they're probably more crucial this year than they are in past years. We divide this topic into who to ask, how to ask, developing a relationship to ask a letter, and the timing of the ask. So who to ask? There's a lot of different people, even within your own institution, you can ask. Certainly, if you've been performing research with someone, that's someone who will know you very well. And um, that's someone who, this would be the one exception where it might be someone who's not necessarily an orthopedic surgeon. If you have a long-standing history of performing research with someone who is uh, perhaps a PhD or in an allied specialty or even an unrelated specialty, they will know your work, your work ethic, what you produce, and be able to write a very meaningful letter. Another person is someone who you developed an orthopedic mentorship with, someone who perhaps you uh, encountered as a M1 and started asking about this path to orthopedics. So you really want someone who knows you well, who knows you best, who's gonna write a letter that's unique to you. And the best letters may not be necessarily the biggest name in the program. Um, sometimes people who uh, have the biggest name are very busy otherwise and may not know you. And it's very important, if it's possible for you to ascertain, that you make sure that this person is going to write the letter himself. There are times when I read a letter from someone who's well-known and it says, I've been told, or I, my faculty tells me. And that's, I always wonder, well, if, if you're hearing about this individual from someone else, why isn't that person writing the letter? Uh, so, and because we all have different uh, points of view in medical specialties, if most of these letters, except for the research person, should be uh, from uh, an orthopedic surgeon. I'm going to advance the slide, and, and, and Jason will speak on the next slide. So, you know, how do you ask for a letter of recommendation? Um, and so, you know, you should be prepared. And, uh, and so, first, you need to understand, does your letter recommendation writer uh, want to get your packet that has all your information electronically or in a folder. You know, there are still um, a lot of people out there who really don't like to read long documents uh, uh, via email. And so, you know, you should have a packet prepared, including your heiress letter, including a photo, including your CV and your personal statement. And the photo is truly there because many times your letter recommendation writer is not just writing your letter but potentially sometimes either 10 to 15 other letters and at times it can really uh, start to cause things to meld together um, and so including that photo helps us to remember uh, exactly who you are um, and make sure uh, uh, that we write the strongest letter possible um, and so when it comes to how to ask uh, please make sure that you know, we've had students in the past where we tell them to provide their CV and their personal statement and and they want the letter, but they haven't given us a personal statement. They tell us, you know, why don't you wait a little bit? I'm still working on it. If you're going to ask us for a letter recommendation, you need to be prepared. Uh, if you can't even provide the simple information that we're asking you for, then then perhaps orthopedics may not be the best specialty for you. Um, and so you really want to show your A game when you're approaching someone asking for a letter and the packet is the beginning of it. 
So to echo that point, and, and did I lose control? I don't have the numbers here. I don't think I have control either. I have I a control I again. So, um, no, I don't. I'm clicking on it. There you go. So as far as that packet, you know, I oftentimes, I, I prefer to have that emailed to myself, and I also prefer to have a copy emailed uh, to my coordinator. That way, uh, there's redundancy. Should I have difficulty finding it down the road when I'm working on the letter, I can ask her to send it for me. So how do you develop a relationship to ask for a letter? It's good to start towards the early part of the rotation, not only to decide who is going to you're going to ask for a letter, but perhaps ask for information from other students or residents about who is a good letter writer. Um, some people may have great interactions, but not write the strongest letter or write a cursory letter. And besides that packet, it's it's important that this be a personal letter, that they be able to express how you are as an individual and what sets you apart. So it's important to be discussing what led you into orthopedics, finding common ground with uh, the person you're asking the letter for, discuss interests outside of orthopedics that either complement your journey towards orthopedics or is how you relax and spend your free time. So they can really write a letter that best characterizes you. Next slide. Sure, and to go back to what uh, Dr. Ahia was you know, saying, I can't stress enough about that developing a relationship meeting because the worst letter of recommendation to read is one where they basically regurgitate your CV. It, you know, it, it really is a very clear indicator that you did not spend enough time with that person so they can get to know who you really are. Um, and so uh, definitely take that time to meet with people. Now, how about timing? You know, um, and so you know, a lot of you all would be doing a four, a, uh, a four week away rotation, but for most of you all, that's not gonna happen. And so most of your letters now are going to be only coming from your home institution. Um, and so, but still, there is an art to the timing of when to ask for a letter of recommendation. Uh, first of all, you know, let your letter recommendation writer know when the letter is due. And, you know, just a big hint, the letter is not due on September 1st, okay? Like, don't tell us that and then expect to, you know, get it as soon as, as Eris opens up. You are, you know, uh, no one, no one is going to get a letter in that quickly. Uh, so give your letter a recommendation writer a reasonable deadline. Understand they have multiple letters to write. Um, as we talked about before, definitely set aside time to discuss uh, any details. You know, if you do have a lower step one score or if you took any time off, things like that will be great if you actually speak with your letter or recommendation writer personally so that they can try to make sure that their letter addresses those issues and uh, uh, kind of smooths out any concerns that that letter recommendation writer, uh, letter or recommendation readers uh, will have. Um, don't give, don't don't ask for their, your, your letter recommendation. You know, the first week. Uh, many times your attendings are just getting to know you in that first week, but also don't wait until the last day either, because. Many times there's a lot of things going on. You're, if you ask for a letter recommendation on Friday at 5 p.m., you know, as you're attending and potentially running to their kid's birthday party, there's a very good chance that they're going to be highly annoyed at you for waiting to that time. But also you may not get your letter because they may forget that you actually asked. Um, and so somewhere around the end of week two or the, or the beginning of week three is a pretty good time to start asking for a letter. Um, and make sure that you understand uh, when uh, the dean's letter is actually released, because for most programs, that is actually when they start reading uh, your entire application. And so making sure that your letter gets in uh, early enough to make this deadline is great. And again, this deadline was pushed back because of COVID. And so you guys do have a little bit more time. And so hopefully these details gave you some information on how to get an all-star letter or recommendation. But the most important thing is that it's about relationship. It's not just about checking off a box and going after the biggest name, but really developing a relationship with someone that can really be an advocate for you. Thank you. So as we said, we're gonna do questions at the end. So I just 
like to emphasize that it's important to set aside some time for that ask and to let it play out the way the person who's writing the letter would like it. Uh, for example, you can say, I'd like to ask for a letter for recommendation. Is this a good time? Or would you like to meet at some particular time? So you, you want it not to be cursory in the sense that they have all the information that they need. We've given you some examples of information we want, but there may be a particular information that they want. Thank you. Julius, I believe okay. you're muted. You're muted, Dr. Oni. Oh, excellent. So I think, uh, yeah, so now you have your letters, you've been mentored and you've uh, networked appropriately and you're getting ready for the interviews. Well, my name is Dr. Julius Oni from Johns Hopkins and I'm going to hopefully um, give you some tips today on how to haste your virtual interviews during this special and unique times. First, we'll talk a little bit about the general approach, and then we will also discuss some general tips that applies to all types of interviews, not just virtual ones. And then much later, I'll give you some tips on virtual specific or Zoom interviews. In general, you just wanna prepare for your virtual interview, just like you would for an in-person interview. You wanna make sure that you are approaching this interview with the same amount of seriousness and focus that you would normally when you uh, were going to travel to the program. One, this is going to allow you to develop the appropriate amount of um, confidence that you need to really shine during this interview. So let's just dive, dive right into it. I have five tips for you, general interview tips. First is to know your application code. Every single thing in your, on your application is going to be fair game. If you say you speak Mandarin, you better be ready to actually speak Mandarin during the interview. Um, and that's the same thing goes for all the research projects that you've actually had uh, that you have listed on your pro, on your application. Make sure you can discuss them intelligently and in, in, in an articulate format. Do your research and the residency program. Make sure that you absolutely know as much as you can about the faculty members, the residents, the, uh, uh, um, the, the format of the, of the residency interview, um, the hospitals that the residents cover, the structure of their, of their curriculum. Um, uh, you, you can get a lot of this information by talking to the residents in the current program or people who have actually interviewed at that same program prior to you. Um, you can also reach out to folks, you know, via social media or, or just jump online and go to the websites. And those are like a great repository of uh, information for you. The third tip is to make sure that you are ready for the common questions. You'd be surprised how many applicants show up to interviews, not ready to give ready answers for uh, 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 very simple questions that are most commonly asked. Things like, tell me about yourself. You know, you should have a two minute summary just to introduce yourself to any interviewer. Um, why did you choose orthopedics? What are you looking for in a training program? Why do you want to train at this particular program? What are your greatest strengths? How about your weaknesses? You know, what do you, where do you see yourself in five years, maybe 10 years? What are your proudest accomplishments? And what is the greatest challenge you ever encountered? And how did you uh, uh, survive it? So make sure you also practice, practice, practice. You know, they say practice makes perfect, and that sounds like a cliche, but it is the truest cliche ever. So make sure that you do mock interviews with people you trust to give you very honest feedback and make sure you record those um, mock interviews. Go back, watch them, see what really um, uh, what you did really well so that you can really reinforce those things. And also see those things that you did poorly so that you can try to optimize those things and correct them. So please make sure you practice, practice, practice. And five, express gratitude. 
say something along the lines of, I thank you for the opportunity to interview with your program or with you. You know, it really means a lot to me. You'll be surprised how that may allow you to emotionally, emotionally connect with your interview interviewer. Um, a lot of re um, applicants are so caught up in trying to deliver the perfect interview uh, 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 performance and, and they completely forget to even say thank you. So don't be that person, you know, appreciate the people who give you the opportunity to interview and you may be surprised at, at, that, uh, at how that separates you. Now let's go into the virtual specific interview tips. Now that you're not going to be able to actually make a lasting impression, you know, in, in, in an in-person interaction, these are some of the ways that you can actually try to stand out um, or at least do very fantastically during your interview virtually. First, make sure that you choose a quiet, well-lit environment. This means not sitting with your back to the window or to a source of bright light that makes you look like a shadow during your interview. Make sure the light source is right in front of the cat, right behind your laptop and shining right at your face so that you can pre present yourself in the best light, literally. Um, and, and make sure that your environment is as quiet as ever so that you can minimize the distractions. Also double check your internet connection to make sure it's strong. You certainly don't want your audio or video feed um, going out during the interview. That could be um, a, a poor form. Also make sure that your laptop is charged and plugged in. You certainly don't want your laptop to die during your interview uh, or, or to start scrambling to try to plug your laptop in. That will not look good. Turn off your phone your computer pop-ups and notification. Those are all major sources of distraction and you certainly do not want to be distracted during your interview. The number five tip is very important. Make sure your background is professional. What that means is that your background, you want, actually want the focus to be on you. So you want your focus, your background to be relatively simple. May, you may have a prop or two in the background to, uh, especially if you want to highlight something special about yourself, you certainly could put, it, put that in the background. For example, if you were an Olympic gold medalist and you want to uh, 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 strategically place your medal in the background, that could be a great source of conversation. And so feel free to do that. And, and if you're not, um, I think a flower vase or something like that, or something like that should do. But then if you're going to put a boat or uh, 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 something like that, be ready to discuss why you put that in, the, in your background also. If we prefer that you don't use a virtual background, but if you do end up using a virtual background, make sure that you use one that does not make you look like a ghost. Um, we've all seen those virtual backgrounds and people uh, um, on video, on Zoom interviews where or of Zoom talks where they keep melting in and out of their virtual background. And, and, and you've also all seen the, the, the halo that, that, kind of, that, that is created around the head of, of people with virtual backgrounds. So please make sure that you, uh, you avoid those mistakes. Also make sure you frame yourself appropriately. So there's a difference between this and that. So you wanna make sure that you fill in the frame of the video so that the focus is really on you. And then the tip six is to dress like you're going to an interview. A uh, solid colored suit should just do fine with a light colored shirt. Um, make sure that you uh, also wear your full outfit just in case you have to stand up during your interview. Uh, it would be very embarrassing if you're wearing a boxer uh, uh, and you have to stand up. The next tip, is to sit up straight as if you're making eye to eye contact. You wanna be staring right into the webcam and that is the equivalent of eye contact and in-person interviews. You do not wanna be looking off of the computer of your computer because that's gonna look very distracting. 
uh, and uh, may uh, uh, distract from your interview. The eighth point is to make sure you clear desktop screen, just in case you need to share your screen um, with the interviewers. The worst thing would be for you to be trying to share your screen and mistakenly have an embarrassing website up. So please make sure you clear your web, um, your desktop screen. And finally, this is another big one. Make sure you do not use your phone to conduct the interview under any circumstances. This is not professional and that should be self-explanatory. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Oni and everyone. Um, I am going to move right into the program director panel. So we have uh, time for live questions at the end as well. Um, uh, we had 360 people register for the webinar, which is outstanding. Um, some people tuning in later to record it, but uh, many people sent in questions. And um, so we're privileged to have with us today program directors um, on the panel from Harvard and Baylor and Rush and University of Minnesota. And so I picked questions that were asked multiple times, uh, even if they were phrased differently. So I like to start, I guess, with Dr. Dyer, but we can have everybody weigh in. Um, and this first question was asked by multiple people. What is a good way to really evaluate if a program is truly diversity centric? and not just diversity tolerant, um, that they're really welcoming to women or minority applicants and not just checking a box? I gave you the that's easy a, that's a, No, thank you, that's a great question. I think the, the very best way is to talk to residents from the program. So if you have any access to people who are there, especially uh, people who are, who are in any of those categories, minorities or women or, or, or people who might not be of the majority, ask them what it's really like, and they'll probably tell you what it's really like. And I'd, I'd say that's the, the number one thing is to, is to ask, not, uh, not in an official way, but in, in, in an unofficial way. Thanks. Can I chime in just for one second on that? Absolutely. Is that, is that okay? So another thing is, um, you know, for programs who may not have a lot of diversity, I think if you feel comfortable enough and you have a one-on-one -on -one with the program director, I think it's okay to ask the program director that question. I was asked it last year multiple times, and I appreciated the opportunity to talk about it openly, and one of the applicants that asked me about it matched in our program. And um, I think that it, it allows you to get an understanding as to the mindset of the program, issues that the program has had in the past with trying to match applicants um, that don't fit the typical stereotype, if you will, and um, talk to the program director about it. And I appreciated it very much when people brought it up. I would I do uh, like echo, go ahead, Bill. Oh, I was going to say I would uh, echo Dr. Kogan's statement. Um, you know, it's it can be challenging if a program does not have as much diversity obviously visible. Um, you know, that just shows what the program got from the computer through the match, not necessarily the applicants that uh, were ranked highly or that were desired. And so, I think. If you don't see the obvious signs of diversity, then you definitely need to ask, because you know I can tell you one one of my years this year is all guys, and I was happy. It's a great class, great people, but I wanted some women in that class, and we ranked plenty of women, but the computer sent us six guys, and so you know just what a program has is not necessarily what we are uh, looking for. Thanks, Thanks Mel. Oh. Maybe I'll, can I chime in a little bit as well? I I just wanted to um, touch on a couple areas. One is is um, you know we've published over the last ten years the um, distribution of females across residency programs, and there's about thirty percent of the programs that train uh, about sixty percent of the women in this country. So if you want to be in a program where there's a lot of women around you and women are not a minority, then I think you can look at the track record. Um, it's published in JBGS. There's lists of who uh, has trained women, who have trained women over the last 10 and 15 years. Now, with that being said, 
uh, as Dr. Harrington brings up, I think there are a lot of programs that want to train women or underrepresented minorities. And just because they haven't, doesn't mean that they uh, don't want to and there aren't good resources. But I would look into to your own um, makeup and whether you want to be more of a token woman. It, I think I, token isn't probably quite the word, right word, gr uh, groundbreaking pioneer. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of women in this country that have done that in, I mean, we have 170 programs across the country. So there have to be women and underrepresented minorities in each of these programs in order to uh, break ground. And there's a really important role for people to do that. But you have to think about that for yourself and how you feel and whether that's a role that you can play or whether you would be, rather be in an environment that um, intrinsically has uh, more individuals that look like yourself. Well, great comments. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, next question, moving in a different direction. There was a lot of talk this year about how many programs applicants should apply to, and um, in this unusual application year, should they apply to more programs, less programs like the court recommendation? Um, so, uh, Dr. Harrington, what are your recommendations on that? There's there's lots of discussion about this, and I think if, probably if you talk to any program director this year or any year, our answer is always less. Um, just because we get so many applications that it's hard to review and figure out who we want to go to. Now, this year is an unusual year. I have a feeling that regardless of the recommendations I've seen and have been involved in numerous discussions on social media about this, that the numbers are probably going to be much higher. Um, but you know, if you really look at some of the data that's available, uh, plus or minus that really the majority of applicants don't need to apply to more than 60 programs. Uh, if you've got board scores above 248, you really don't need to apply to more than 40-ish programs probably. Um, so, you know, I would hope that people would apply to fewer, but I don't think that's going to happen this year. Any other comments on that? Okay. If I could just jump in a little bit. What, what I wish is is that people would apply to the right programs, to the ones that they're that they're really interested in and that they have thought about, um, and that they have made some some uh, effort to find out about, rather than sort of checking the box and and um, and blasting out. You know, it's very easy to sit at your computer and click ten more programs that you don't really even know where they are. But if um, if you can have good advisement about what places would actually fit you well, you you can probably make a list and it still may be a pretty long list, but everywhere on there will be there for a reason. And that would be my plea to you is please think about every place that you, every box you check and do it for a reason. Thanks. Um, that's a, I think that's a great, uh, great advice. And on that note, Dr. Kogan, what, is, what do you think is an appropriate way for applicants this year? Um, to reach out or to uh, connect with programs that they're interested in or that they may be interested in? Um, I would say to send an email um, expressing the interest in the program, why you're interested in the program, um, and make sure that the email is not a cut and pasted email from some other program. So make it specific to the program, if you have some connection to the area, if you have some connection to whatever it is in the program, um, send an email to the program director and just and just let them know. That's great. Um, do you, any other comments on there? A lot of questions of how to stand out in a year with no away rotations and uh, this virtual format. Yeah, I just I just had one thing to add for Dr. Kogan. You know, one of the things we we instruct a lot of students. I mean, you're, you're, we're basically cold calling programs that have never seen you. And so there are, there are tons of ways that you can do this strategically. Um, when we talked and Dr. Taylor talked about the technological aspect and the, the greater grasp of technology that a lot of our students have, and part of that is just how to search for information. When you send something to a program, you need to have something in there that is a connection to that program. You can look up a thousand things, but put something in there 
that actually resonates with the program. One of the things that we've advised students to do is when you look at the mission statement, the vision statement for program, use the language that they use. Okay, mirroring is, a, is something we do in an interviewing standpoint, but mirroring can also be something you do when you communicate with the program in any media. So if you're, if you're in an interview and you're assessing how people are speaking to you and giving back to them the way that they interpret the same kind of speech patterns, language, et cetera, do that in your email, do that in your text message. Mirror the language that the program puts out there and also mirror the language that they put out in their own kinds of, of, of media out, media kind of advertisements and other kinds of messaging. When you do that, then you get then it's easier for the program to interpret your your inquiry as somebody who's like them. And then where there's a whole there's a whole webinar I'm sure about about how to be interpreted as warm warm and competent as opposed to cool and incompetent. But the bottom line is if you echo and mirror the language and even some of the wording for the programs, the reception rate the the rate of response is actually different and this has actually been documented and so i would advise people to think very strategically about how you approach these programs and you may have to do it differently than you've done it in the past john one more thing just let me um i would also say if you're really interested in the program to reach out to some of the residents in the program um you know i've had residents come up to me and say hey listen this student from x it sounds really great i've met with him or her um, very interested in the program, you know, just wanted to give my two cents. And it makes a difference. And so if you can get access to the residents' emails, it's usually on the website. Um, I would say definitely to try that as well. Thank you. That's great. And I, I'm not supposed to chime in, but I would also say if you want resident uh, contact information and you're not finding it, reach out to the program coordinator or the program director. Everyone's very happy to connect you with people in their program. Um, another question, uh, Dr. Van Keese, what do you think um, programs are going to be emphasizing this year and a year with no away rotations and um, how can students uh, distinguish themselves um, in this environment? And do you think, uh, another thing that went with that, do you think people should make specific comments about the program in their personal statement or is that not the right place? Uh, thanks, Don. That's uh, really great questions. Um, so just to start at the end, uh, I do think it's helpful to make references in the personal statement. Um, if there's, you know, I'm from Minnesota, if there's nothing in your whole uh, ERAS application about Minnesota, but you actually were born in Minnesota and you have relatives in Minnesota, if you put that in your personal statement, uh, that's a place for me to pick up on that. And it and it tells me, why do you want to come to Minnesota? That you took time to actually think about the program. Like Dr. Dyer said, you know, tell us why you want us just so we know why we should want you and, and have a reason. Don't just check a box and then let us know what that reason is. So ways that you can um, stand out this season and what we're going to look at because we don't have away rotations. Um, First, as a resource, I would refer you to the uh, AOA CORD. So CORD is the Council of Orthopedic Residency Directors. And on the website, there's a tab for residents and students. Um, and one of the tabs is the residency interviews and, vir and virtual experiences. Uh, this is a place where the residency program directors uh, go to post uh, some of the elements of their program. Uh, for us, for example, uh, we've run two town halls. If any of you are interested, our residents are running a town hall on Thursday night. Uh, I ran a town hall about two weeks ago, and this is just an opportunity for students to come, similar to what we're doing tonight. I tell about the program, people get to ask questions. The one on Thursday night is the residents telling about the program, residents getting to ask questions. Uh, many places are running virtual experiences. Again, you know, it's fine to do cold, cold calling. For me personally, if uh, once you've done some of your background, if you're interested in our uh, program, I'd love you to do a virtual experience. It's not a rotation. It's maybe eight or 10 hours. It's an opportunity to come to our grand rounds, our core curriculum, uh, maybe one of our journal clubs, maybe do a pre presentation. We'll set you up to chat with some of the residents that are assigned at certain sites. Uh, so I think a lot of the programs are also reaching out to you. Um, and that uh, the uh, CORD 
uh, document is one of the ways that you can find the programs and how they're trying to reach out with you with these uh, virtual experiences. Thanks. A lot of the programs are also publicizing this on social media, um, and so you know the, it's out there. Um, what I wanted to ask one more question to the panel, um, and then we'll open up to live questions and for all of the faculty. But um, as a group or whoever wants to chime in, do you have any? Um, what is your advice to reapplicants? So folks who are reapplying this year. Um, I can I can start that. For a reapplicant, it is incredibly important that you have someone who can speak you into the program. That's really the bottom line. You you've got to have somebody who's willing to personally advocate for you at whatever program it is that you're that you're trying to apply to. There's some places that won't even accept an application um, if you've reapplied for a variety of reasons. So so the the idea here is that you've applied, you didn't get anywhere. You're you're reapplying. And almost every instance where I've seen someone get into a program has been they there's someone who took an interest in them. Maybe they did a research year. Maybe they did um, direct um, directly worked with a program or were sponsored by a physician. And that physician who had decision making power decided that they would advocate for them through the process. I have not seen it work otherwise, and maybe other people have other experiences. Don, if, if I could chime in. Um, yeah. So I, I do agree with what Dr. Ross says that there are programs that won't look at an applicant that has applied before and not been successful. And, and I think it, one of the first things you have to do is take a look at yourself and try to figure out, do a post-mortem, and this could have been done uh, probably right after the match. Why did I not match? Was it a particular aspect of my application that I have to bolster, or did I fall through the cracks? And that does happen. We we tend, it's one of the reasons why it's easy on this side of the equation for us to say, limit the number of programs you apply to, and people don't. Because there is, there is the reality that there are very good applicants who are perfectly well qualified, who will have excellent careers, who sometimes do fall through the cracks. If that is the case, then by all means, you need to go ahead and, and apply to programs that have a track history of looking at people who haven't applied before, or who haven't matched before. If there is something that is unfixable though, then it might be behoove you to take consideration for also backing it up with other specialties should this be, uh, trip be unsuccessful again. So I think it really depends on your own personal situation. Certainly if you can have an entree, and in the past that would have been a rotation, that would have been uh, visiting the program and those things are inaccessible. So now you have to look for that perso personal um, interaction. One advantage that you would curiously have this year as someone who didn't match is that you probably did do away rotations last year where no one else has been able to do away rotations. So you can reach out to those programs as well. Great point. I would also yeah. emphasize that as a reapplicant, you want to have a new application. Uh, so that means, you know, I look for new letters of recommendation from folks who you've worked with uh, con more contemporarily. And also, um, I want to see some evidence of reflection, uh, like Dr. Mejia said, in your personal statement as to answering the question, why why didn't I match? And this is why I think I didn't. And this is what I've done to to make things better. Because, you know, the, the way I look at it is if you did not match with your previous year's application, resubmitting it again this year is not going to make anything different. So, you know, whether you had zero research and now you've got 10 research publications or, you know, something like that, you want to see something different and also something reflected in your letters. I just want to give a, a, a little encouragement to the to the to the reapplicant this year. I, it is a tough spot, and anyone would agree that it is. But for uh, the, both the reason Dr. Mejia said that you you have the plus actually of having rotated, which you're which you which the others have not. Um, also, this year all programs are a little more attuned to their network of sort of direct referrals 
for people who are being carried kind of at, through the door. Um, and a number of the other panelists sort of mentioned that. But I think if you can put all that together, I think if you can find a good mentor who will kind of carry you to the door, you may find the door sort of curiously more open actually this year than it might have been. Great. Thanks. Um, so I want to thank all of the faculty members. Um, we are open to any additional questions. If people wanted to send them in for maybe 10 more minutes, um, maybe I'll throw out one question. We do have a number of second and third year students that registered, which I think is great looking forward. Um, and they had an uh, interesting question. Um, what um, advice do you have for second and third year medical students whose um, ortho CV is getting impacted by COVID, so their research experiences, their um, early exposures, and their clerkships. Well, one of the things to keep in mind is that we're all in the same boat, you know, so everyone's being impacted. But, you know, we're not completely shut down now. Uh, there are, people are starting to go back to labs, they're starting to do some work in uh, in research, people are always doing chapters. So you can t take advantage to get involved as actively as you can at this juncture. Um, certainly, we all wish things were different, but they're not. Um, so I, I think being as participatory as you can, so when hopefully um, sometime in 21, when things go a little bit more back to normal, you'll already have, already have a foundation to build off of. Yeah, and I just wanted to just wanted to add, you know, you can still make it happen. I mean, being creative in this time is is really going to be the critical separating factor. You know, for interventions, we just had a summer program that was drastically changed from our normal, but we did have a a research symposium. Students did research over the summer with several uh, with a couple of folks here on the call, and it was different, and and certainly there were some challenges, but research projects got com got completed and people have ongoing research that they will be doing through the, the next couple of years. And part of it just means, you know, truly being creative. You may have to change some of the program, the, some of the types of research that you're concentrating on. Some of it may not be as powerful as it had been previously because you're not hands-on, but there are opportunities for you to, one, still interact in a research mentorship pr perspective with individuals, and your mentor, whoever that he or she may be, can be an instrumental part of this, which is why mentorship, again, is a, is a critical a critical factor. But find a way. Um, find a way to connect with somebody and do a research project virtually. Find a way. Maybe the virtual process itself is part of the research project. All of these things can happen. And so make certain, though, that, that, you, that we don't and this is what we encourage these students, it's not that you can't do it, it's just that you can't do it the way you did it before. And since we're all in the same boat of we don't know what's coming next, then the, the drive to creativity, the drive to using your imagination to figure out research projects based on the technology available, um, really is in the favor of these second and third year students who have a, a much better grasp than some of us about the technology that's available and how it can be manipulated. So I, I say there is opportunity out there and there is a significant amount of opportunity based on your creativity that will allow you to do research in a way that's different than the past, but certainly should still be able to, to help you stand, stand above some of your peers and to stand out in a way that allows you to be gain entry into these programs. That, those are great points. I'll just add one more thing, you know, extrapolating into the informal networking uh, that happens. And so what this really global, like Dr. Mejia said, um, pandemic and, and everyone's in the same boat has caused is that some of the pressures for socialization and going places you would normally not venture just to hang out with the guys or the group, um, those are off the table. And, you know, for someone like me, based on my experiences, that actually is a little reassuring that I can get to know people purely based on who I am, what I've done, what I like outside of school or work, et cetera, and not necessarily how late could I stay up? Could I, you know, drive a golf cart? Could I do these things that in some ways perpetuated inequities, right? And, and, and it's, we're exclusive. So that's one thing, one 
layer that's been removed during this time that you might, you know, hopefully for a lot of you find favorable. I, I would just like to add that, you know, at second and third years, you know, you li just listen to the mentoring talk. You now actually have way more time to establish deeper relationships with people one on one over the next one to two years before you start applying. So take advantage of that, you know, um, email these people, find people that know the people that you want to have mentor you, have them introduce you, set up a stand in every two months, you know, check in with, with, with the people you want to have mentor you and uh, make sure that you're actually following through with the things that they're advising you to do. That way, when it's time to write letters, they're going to write very detailed letters that really helps you to shine. So uh, you actually at advantage here, take advantage of, uh, of all the opportunities that are in front of you. Great, thanks. So there are actually a couple questions that came in about letters of recommendation. Um, so one question, um, are orthopedic letters always preferred over non-orthopedic letters? And what are recommendations for somebody who's applying to multiple specialties, you know, like a backup, um, how to select their letter writers and or somebody who's doing a gen surge prelim year? <laughs> so multi. If, if I could jump to that letter, I, I actually think this might be the year that letters from somebody who knows you better and is not an orthopedic surgeon are going to be more valuable because we haven't had a chance to meet so many of you and so if 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 anybody just has a good honest perspective on you even if they are in some other field of medicine I, i'm actually more interested in a letter like that this year than i ever have been So I would say that's an interesting, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Dyer is the head, the head of a huge, uh, you know, and historic program. And so that's great for Harvard. But, you know, guys, I would say just be careful because there are some programs that are very anti orthopedic, you know, letter, you know, and uh, and, you know, even if your letter is from a Nobel Prize winning cardiologist, you know, they may kind of, you know, look past it as not that important. And so um, but if that person knows you the best, um then by all means you know definitely use it we had some questions come in electronically that ask how many letters recommendation do we normally have to request for a lot of programs it's three um just answering that there was another question that someone asked about the eslor and whether um uh what the faculty felt about having a letter recommendation in that format versus just you know a letter recommendation on a letterhead do you think it matters this year so i think the uh, to take sort of a middle ground i agree with dr dyer that someone who knows you the best without a doubt is the person who should be writing your letter but to also to agree with dr brooks um one of the advantages if that person who knows you the best is an orthopod is that we tend to view things in a similar fashion. We are a little bit monolithic. And more importantly, especially in this time when you can't introduce yourself, it's a small community. We tend to know other people within our field. And oftentimes, if someone, if we're a little bit on the fence or we want some clarification, especially when we're talking with the faculty, we'll say, you know, do you know Dr. Kogan? And someone will reach out to Dr. Kogan and get uh, a little bit more feedback. And that's a little bit more difficult to do when we're outside the field. So there are, um, I think someone who knows you the best trumps everything. But if that person happens to be an orthopod, there's strength in that as well. I, I think in this situation, I would ask that non-orthopedic surgeon letter writer to preface their letter with, because this person was unable to do away rotations. Um, I am a person who knows them well and feel I can, you know, make a good recommendation for a surgical field or something like that. So that they've addressed the fact that they know that they should have gotten a letter from an orthopedic surgeon, but they just didn't have that option this year. And just one thing, uh, having been a member of the uh, court academics committee, I have to promote the uh, ESLOR. Um, so, 
please submit it. Uh, please have your letter writers submit it. We're trying to use that to collect data on it so they can submit that. They can either leave the letter down in the written comments section at the end or attach a separate uh, letter, but please have them do this standardized letter to help us collect data for the long term. And uh, just for reassurance on the East floor, there's a really nice section where people can write personal comments. So it's not just checking off boxes. You can have a, a very robust East floor letter. Um, one question that I don't know the answer to, um, or I think I know, and it's not the right answer. Somebody asked, is there any way for them to find out what the board score cutoffs are for programs? And I know CORD has been working on putting something together um, to that end, but it, it's not out there. Um, any guidance on that so that people can apply smartly? Programs don't publish it. You know, it, it, it's one of those things where you kind of have to speak to residents uh, or speak to your faculty and kind of they kind of know, you know, uh, the uh, the the unspoken word about that for each program. Um, but but you're not going to find some online repository for better, or for worse uh, programs just don't you know publish that. Well, and that's right. And one thing um, I will say is a lot of programs are moving more towards um, looking holistically at your application. You know, at, at my program at Duke, um, we review every single application that comes to us, even if it's 800 or 850. I mean, we'll see what it is this year. So it gets looked at at least by a few people. But you know, it's not so much a cutoff, but you may have know a holistic picture you know so where you might feel your strength is not in one area if it's absurdly high in another then the two work together and so i do believe there was a time and hopefully we're evolving from this where there were these hard hard cutoffs and and they that number was creeping higher and higher as y'all got smarter and smarter um but you know for just my my perspective it really comes down to balancing out everything together and not just one factor alone and I can also tell you from my role as fellowship director, um, not every place has ridiculously high cutoffs if they have cutoffs at all. I see plenty of outstanding fellowship applicants who have board scores in the 220s and 230s, 240s, you know, all over the place. And they somehow amazingly graduated as outstanding residents. Um, so it's not all about the board scores and even programs that may have a cutoff. I'm sure you will find some residents in the program who are below that supposed cutoff. Um, you know, people do look at other things besides just the board scores. It's just one of the things we look at, um, you know, within programs, there may be some folks who are more stuck on numbers and, you know, your 239 is definitely better than that person's 238. Um, but, um, you know, overall, I think we're trying to get more holistic, uh, which is another reason why all of us program directors jump up and down about trying to do holistic review on over 800 applicant applications. That's, that's challenging. <laughs> so, so I, I could add a, a few points. I think that, uh, as everyone who has said, it's certainly true that we're trying to move away from this. Uh, the board is going to start being pass-fail for step one. Um, but that being said, it doesn't really solve the problem for the applicant right now. Um, I think Dr. Dyer sort of alluded to this, that one way is to talk to people who have been ahead of you. But I know that at a certain point, one of, um, one of my current PGY4s, when he was a medical student, started a spreadsheet where people who rotated at places fed into that at our particular institution um, and then also correlated with where people matched so that for a period of time, he had some data as far as people from our particular institution, where they were likely to match depending on their scores. Uh, obviously, this is very parochial because it was just a small group, um, but that is something that uh, for the student who's asking the question, friends he has who matched last year or matched the year before can give him sort of an idea of where they got interviews, where they didn't get interviews, where they got, were able to do a ways, which would be sort of a substitute for getting interviews right now because some people have cutoffs for their rotations as well. Just to give some kind of uh, idea of where where they lie in the pack. And, and this is 
this is another reason to reach out to these organizations, Gladden, Nth Dimensions, et cetera, because we have a, a lot more of that information. Um, and, and it's another reason for you to be part of a larger group of individuals who are interested in mentoring people who look like you, um, who have a track record of doing that. But that very idea of a spreadsheet where people are more likely to get in based on their boards, based on their scores, um, that information does exist. And information usually is proprietary to the, to the organizations that compile it. And so being part of those organizations and as many of those organizations as you can be part of is a great way for you to gain access to that information and be guided in a way that's, that's going to be more helpful for you if you find yourself on, in the, on the borderline. And for whoever has that question, they may be concerned about their board scores. So if your step one score is relatively low, um, one of the ways to make yourself a little more competitive, since that is still a metric that is being used to uh, evaluate candidates, is to make sure that your step two scores reflect who you think you are. Um, so uh, if obviously your step one scores is, uh, are low, then maybe uh, take step two early um, and get a great score. And, and, and then you would have a fantastic story of how you uh, encountered a significant challenge, prepped for the next exam, and overcame. Um, so um, there's multiple ways to uh, to approach this, but I'm happy to hear that we're starting to look at these candidates a lot more holistically and not just uh, judging them based on the board scores. We had a question that got you know, sent in uh, where it was from uh, a student who uh, is an international a medical a graduate. And, you know, I know we talked about the plight of the low step one score during this application cycle, but at baseline, uh, international students may, may have a harder time matching into orthopedics. How are you guys advising those students who are uh, foreign medical graduates, whether they should even apply this year or are you telling them to give it a shot or you know, how are you guys advising that group of students? I'll chime in. I think that's a, a similar group to reapplicants. I think you need to have a good um, advocate or mentor um, to reach out to programs on your behalf. I wouldn't tell people not to apply this cycle. Um, there is actually data on you know, which programs have taken international medical uh, graduates before. Sometimes that's helpful. And then to speak to somebody who's gone through that program. Um, but I think that's um, another group where having somebody who will really go to bat for you makes a big difference. Definitely. And for a lot of international applicants, um, typically it's uh, tough to apply just right outside of medical school. Typically, um, a lot of programs like to see that you've had some clinical experience in the U.S. system. Um, or at least a significant uh, interface with clinicians in the U.S. system. So you may be a research fellow, but at least uh, you've been to clinics and you're familiar with the, with the way that the U.S. system works. And in that regard, international applicants are usually, um, they, they're not a monolith, um, they, they, you know, applicants from um, countries that have similar healthcare systems to the U.S. usually are at advantage. So if you're coming from the U.K. or Canada, um, I think you are certainly a different um, uh, uh, international applicant than if you're coming from a, 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 a some other um, well, maybe developing country. So um, know what your strengths are, talk to people, get a list of those um, institutions that are, that give some chances to uh, international applicants. Maybe try to get research fellowships at those institutions, improve yourself, maybe even get into a general surgery um, um, prelim uh, uh, um, year first, get some clinical experience under your belt and then apply. But um, it's a tough place to be in general. So, so we have taken international medical graduates at certain points in the past. And this, this is a, obviously very difficult uh, for, the, for the applicant. Um, 
I think for better or worse, I, I think they, they're going to be held to a higher standard. Um, I think it's difficult for us to justify giving a spot to an international grad if there's an equal weighted applicant from the U.S. So generally, these are people who uh, are, are arguably the top person in their country. I think that most of the time when we have done this in the past, they've had significant amount of research in this country. And I think if they have, if it's a research uh, year where they have some clinical, that's great. I would be hesitant to recommend them to actually doing a clinical, uh, like a general surgery or something like that, because you, you are burning the years that you are have funding for as well as that doesn't build your CV quite as well as a researcher. So I think if you are an international medical graduate, you have to have an excellent score. Um, and, and you have to have a significant amount of research, uh, probably over a course of perhaps more than one year um, to be a reasonable applicant. It's a very, very difficult road, road to go. It's, uh, it, it's not impossible, but it, it ha you have to be realistic that many people don't succeed on that, that path. That's a great point, uh, Dr. Mejia. I actually was recommended the general surgery in addition to the multiple uh, uh, years of uh, research, but I, I, your point is well taken, that that may be a year burned. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you all uh, for your, everyone's time and for uh, the uh, students that are on, please reach out to us with any questions you have. I was going to end with a slightly different but positive question. We had a question from uh, one of the students asking, why did you decide on orthopedics and what drives you? So maybe a few people can answer that and we can uh, call it a night for tonight. So thanks. Okay, I can. I can I can speak to that. I was okay. about to say I want to hear Dr. Ross. I okay, want to hear so, Dr. Ross. Okay, so two two things. One, my dad was an orthopedic surgeon. Okay, and growing up, I had no idea what he did. He left the house early, came home late. I had no clue what my dad did. He was just my dad. And so one day he took me to work. I was about twelve. Um, I was big for my for my age. Took me to work, and my dad. We were at a, we lived in the Bay Area in Oakland, California. Uh, my dad was walking down the hallway. First of all, he knew everybody from the janitor to the to actually to the chief nursing officer. Walked into a room. A woman had dislocated her shoulder. A 90-year-old senile had fallen out of her wheelchair, dislocated her shoulder. And my dad started telling people in the room what to do. And I was shocked. I, I was floored that my dad could walk into a room and just tell people what to do. And then they were just doing it and looking at him like, what do we do next? The next thing is he helped let me help. He, I held a sheet around her chest. He took her arm in his hands. He took his shoe off and put his foot in her axilla and pulled the shoulder back in place. I felt it pop. I thought it was the most barbaric and wonderful thing I had ever seen in my life. And really from that moment on, I wanted to be an orthopedist. And even though I tried to jeopardize that in my undergrad, I have never, ever, ever uh, been sad or or regret or regretted choosing orthopedics. Now, there's a lot of impediments to the joy of orthopedics. The begging people for money who who've already agreed to pay you is not fun. The the bureaucracy that has grown around the practice of medicine is not fun. But the idea that I get a chance to change almost dramatically in some cases, almost immediately in some cases, the quality of life for individuals on a regular basis is phenomenal. And, and for me, I feel it's more of a blessing in something that I'm allowed to do as opposed to something that some kind of profession. One of the things that we talk to our students about is if you can choose something that you're passionate about, that you can, that the world needs, um, that you can get better at, meaning that you already have a desire to be motivated to be better at it, and you can get paid for it, then you're not waking up to a job, you're waking up to purpose. And that's kind of pretty much how I feel on a regular basis. I would totally echo what Dr. Wright uh, Ross. I, I, I wake up most mornings, I not believing that someone's paying me to do what I do. Um, and uh, it, it's just it's just incredibly fun. And 
the instant gratification part definitely and people who know me know my brain is a little scattered you know sometime i don't have a long attention span or any of those things but you know no one who gets their spleen cut out says thank you doctor for taking out my spleen you know <laughs> like the belly just hurts you know but when you can immediately restore someone's quality of life like their leg was shattered and the next day they can ambulate you know like they saw their wrist bent backward and then the next day you know like they can move all their fingers because you fixed their their disradius fracture you know um or they've been you know uh, almost uh in a wheelchair because of their hip arthritis and you replace their hips and and then they can move again i mean that instant gratification th there's almost no other field that can give patients that and uh and you get that every day in, in orthopedics and so it really does allow you to go home every day knowing that you immediately helped a lot of patients couldn't have said it any better dr brooks agree that's awesome. You all picked the right specialty, I and mean, there's nothing better than orthopedics or patients. You restore their uh, quality of life, and you'll ne I think you'll never meet an orthopedic surgeon who doesn't love what they do. Um, and I think that's what pulls a lot of us into into it. So um, great decision. And we get to play with power tools. <laughs> yeah, and we have the best the best tools. That's right, the best colleagues, the best tools, and really. Great, great patients. So thank you everybody for tonight. I am sorry we ran over, but this was really outstanding. Um, good luck in the application cycle. Please reach out if we can help with anything. Thank you all. I look thank forward you. to hearing from, from all yep. of you. Yep, thank you. We'll thank you. Thanks for organizing. Great profession. Great. Welcome. All right.